And the problem is women are very trusting of the doctor that is taking care of them, as they should be, by the way, but almost too trusting, not questioning things that don't seem quite right, which is why someone who has a little more than just the medical knowledge, like yourself, you bring massive medical knowledge, but then you also add in all these other things that apply that make it so you actually heal and not just kind of help manage it. Uh, and I feel like a lot of women get mismanaged at that point in their life. It's true. And it's also because I always tell clients, you know, I, I, one of the reasons I write the books and, and do what I do, it's because I wish no other physician the journey I've been on to learn what I know. Right, Jimmy? I mean, I was at that point, you know, desperate, depressed, you know, over 240 pounds, a mess mentally too, and just struggling. And, you know, I would say stress, depressed, and my hormones were a mess. And my doctor's bag was empty. And, yeah. you know, and that, that was heartbreaking. That was a heartbreaking place to be. So it took me a journey around the world to learn what I know and different styles of medicine and different styles and approaches to healing. I have so much more to learn, but um, I really am excited about what, what we're able to do naturally and integratively that works for the benefit of the patient. I always hear patients too come tell me, Dr. Anna, I didn't know how bad I was feeling till I started feeling good again. Yeah. Take us in the mind of your colleagues in the medical field. Like you obviously go to OBGYN conferences and other medical conferences. You talk to your colleagues and you're just like real excited because you're seeing these great results with your patients. Are they down because they just don't understand why they didn't have the adequate knowledge? Or how, how do those conversations go? You know, it, it, it can be received a few different ways. And you just made me flash back to pre-COVID speaking in a, um, attending a conference for the Southeastern OBGYN Society. So it's a lot of the, you know, I, you know, really our ivory tower of the South academicians and, you know, gyneco gynecologist, you know, gyne gynecology oncologist and maternal fetal medicine docs and and this just amazing array of, of brilliant brilliant people and a few are like you know are are wide open or really like okay you know i i want to learn more i don't want to just be a pimp for pharmaceutical right like i need to learn more and understand this because i'm going through the stage of life now and what I, I just don't feel good with my options so i've had those receptions and i've had the complete opposite where essentially you know just blackwalled right just um like nope i don't want to hear about it it's not scientifically proven it's not you know what you know whatever there's no pharmaceutical studies to verify i'm like well hold on a second when we're talking about bioidentical hormone there are you know hundreds if not thousands of studies thousands of studies looking at bioidentical hormones first of all and then you know understanding traditional medicine let's not cut off a whole you know uh, type of science yeah. because it's not in our ivory towers you know, we need to understand the generational, the lessons that have been <laughs> experienced before us. And that's where traditional science comes in. Well, and they've done the same thing to ketogenic diet research as well. Well, we don't have enough long-term research. Well, first it was, we don't have any research. Then Westman, Volick, that guy, Finney, different ones started coming out with different uh, studies. And then they're like, well, we have too many short-term studies. We need longer-term studies. Now we got Verda Health doing, they're in their fourth year of their study. We don't have a, 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 but like they run out of excuses at some points because it's strong evidence and now it kind of makes their whole narrative crumble. Right, absolutely. And what science has been done on menopausal women? Like as I entered this field and this uh, decade of my life too, there was no, no good research in menopausal women with keto. Now we've had tens of thousands of women go through keto green lifestyle and it's transformative. It's transformative. And so that's what I want people to know. I mean, experience it. Watch your key, you know, four key lab values. We talked about this in the podcast we did with you and just you know key lab test how are you doing with the recommendations that you've been given what are your lab markers and let's watch them improve it just breaks my heart when I, people come to me 
and their hemoglobin A1C is six or their inflammatory marker is, is high. And it's like, it's been going there for years. It's and been going there for years. And they're told it's normal because it's within range, which is why I've been railing against the ranges of people. It's ranges of sick people. The people that go see their doctor, they're sick. And so you don't want to be in the normal range. You want to be in the optimal range, which is a far lower for A1C, for example, definitely below 5.5, five, optimally under 5. Yes, yes, I, I agree 100%. And then, too, everything we can now to improve our immune system. And women in perimenopause, because progesterone supports THT immunity, we really want to look at that. That's, again, another good reason to supplement postmenopausally with progesterone. But just at this time where we want to support our immune system. And I loved your hokey pokey um, post today. It was you good. Gotta, you got to use code, my dear, because if you don't, they will ban you everywhere. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. I, again, like we're science, you know, science, I look at the numbers. The numbers yeah. don't lie. No. And they're, and they're actually probably worse. Those are just the reported numbers. There's, it's probably a multiplicity times 10 to 100, those numbers I shared today. Um, and it's unfortunate because people deserve to know what those numbers are. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of progesterone, I had one other question. I, I had two questions. So the second one actually is related to progesterone. Brittany wanted to know, would progesterone levels increasing during certain times of the month, ostensibly around the, your period, cause pain in various parts of your body other than down there? Are there is, is there any relationship between the progesterone leading to pain? Yeah. Um, not directly uh, yeah um and so like normally in our cycle when we start our first day of bleeding is cycle day one the first day we start our period we call that day one so that's our first day of our of our menstrual cycle so somewhere around day 12 to 14 in a normal 28 to 30 day cycle we ovulate and so after ovulation, our progesterone level increases from the ovarian production of progesterone. And so that rises up pretty sharply and will stay risen until either um, a pregnancy implants for implantation until we become pregnant or no pregnancy. And then the progesterone levels will fall, will start bleeding again. And so progesterone is a natural, is a natural anti-inflammatory hormone. It's a natural diuretic. So in, you, you know, our body's natural response is typically protective and it shouldn't, we shouldn't have so much cramping and those are inflammatory. Those are inflammatory consequences. There's something called substance P It has nothing to do with progesterone. But it's called substance P and it's an inflammatory um, uh, peptide that is secreted when we have our, when we start bleeding or we have getting ready to menstruate and can cause a significant amount of, of pain and cramping. And so things that we can do to decrease that are, are natural anti-inflammatories like turmeric, you know, maca works really, really well. And, um, and, you know, um, uh, I think it's a white willow bark, something, white willow bark, white, or is that white bark or white willow bark? Is that Adaptogen, what is it? it it's uh, herbal anti-inflammatory, herbal oh. anti-inflammatory, like an aspirin, like you. an aspirin. Yeah, and then, or use ibuprofen, or I typically tell clients to leave at the start of their period and 12 hours after, that'll decrease that inflammatory response. So, you know, that's a, definitely a good option. But then again, the anti-inflammatory diet, take out sugar, because sugar is pro-inflammatory, and that's going to worsen, worsen symptoms in the perimenopause, as well as alcohol. That's another biggie. And the seed oils, I would assume, as well. Seed oils are great. Yes. Great for what? Um, see, well, like thinking of a black currant seed oil, like well, um, okay. or that, oh. that's one. I, I just want to make sure people hear the distinction because when you said they're great, I was like, all right, not canola oil, corn oil. Oh no. Okay, that, that's why I knew you had a a, a distinction oh. when you say seed oils, vegetable yeah. oil. What is the common vernacular? But go ahead and explain. Oh. 
Yeah, no, I immediately was thinking like yeah. gamelin oleic I, acid or black currant oil or evening primrose oil. I was thinking those yeah, those can be very anti-inflammatory and helpful for menstrual uh, menstrual cycles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I was like, she said, yes, guys. Uh-oh, I got to clarify what, because I knew you didn't mean canola oil, corn oil, cottonseed oil. Those are, because those would also increase inflammation. Absolutely. No, they don't even exist in my sphere. Right. Well, sadly, they exist out there, even in some foods. Uh, almost all the nuts, unless they're raw, are roasted in one of those really bad oils. And so just buyer beware, you guys. Read, read carefully before you buy. Real Good Foods is one of the fastest growing frozen food companies in the U.S. Everything they make is nutrient dense high in protein, low in carbs, and made from real food ingredients. Instead of using processed flours, everything they make is 100% grain-free and gluten-free, which is how they keep their carbs so low. They can be found at Costco, Walmart, Target, Kroger, and in almost every grocery store nationwide. Or you can order online. Check us out today at realgoodfoods.com and at Real Good Foods on social media. Well, let's dive into what you mentioned earlier when we were talking about stress and how it changes the alkalinity uh, and makes it more acid in your body. Talk about this mind-body connection because I think this is something, Anna, we don't hear enough about. We've, I've had people on my shows over the years for years talking till they're blue in the face about diet and exercise and sleep and all of these things. But hardly ever do we hear when you have negative thoughts, when you have things that just consume you stress-wise, that has a physical impact on your body. It probably shows up in blood work like blood sugar and insulin and inflammation, but then it manifests disease. Can you kind of get into that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. And it's something that I'm so passionate about and passionate talking about because I've suffered from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and I'm passionate about converting PTSD to post-traumatic growth. And, and it's a daily, it's a daily practice. And let me tell you this, you know, I'm just going to reiterate it for those who are new. I talked about checking urine pH as a vital sign because, um, even if we're eating perfectly healthy, right? Eating all amazing greens and this, that, and the other. If we have toxic thoughts, if we're under real perceived or post-traumatic stress, we are going to increase our cortisol. And with, with that, it increase, it, increases the acidity within our system. Cortisol is the most acidifying hormone. It creates, it increases hydrogen ion secretion across the renal tubules, causing, we're able to see that in the urine. So everyone should check and just see, have, have fun and do, go outside and go for a hike. And that increase, decreases cortisol and increases the most alkalinizing hormone, which is oxytocin. Now this is really important. So like you can see when you have a good time, you feel better, you're like, you know, but you can see this in your urine too. You can see the more alkaline urine pH. My clients have done this, you know, they, they always are so excited when they prove this to themselves. So, but one of the things that people don't realize when you're under real perceived chronic daily stress or, or post-traumatic, you have a constant level of cortisol. Yeah. And eventually your brain's like, okay, I'm going to shut you down because cortisol, you're frying me out. But when cortisol goes up, oxytocin goes down because yeah. you've got to, you've got to react, right? There's no time to attach, right? You've got to just react. And so when cortisol's up, oxytocin's down. And when cortisol's up for a long time, cortisol's suppressed and oxytocin suppressed too. And what that feels like, that's that burnout. That's that. I know I love my work, but I I, I don't want to I don't want to go in anymore. I know I love my wife, my husband, but I don't feel love for them anymore. You know, and and like you know, you don't you feel isolated, depressed, and um and you withdraw and you withdraw. And honestly, right now, a friend of mine called me the other day. Her daughter had a suicide attempt and just heartbroken. She goes, but all the all the clinics, all the psych wards, all the psychiatric facilities are are full to the brim with yeah. waiting lists, 
full to the brim and no other time has it ever been like this.